Violence committed against individuals because of their race, religion, national origin, gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation remains a serious problem in America. In the nearly 20 years since the 1990 enactment of the Hate Crime Statistics Act, the number of hate crimes reported has consistently ranged from around 30,000 or more annually. For more than one hate crime every 15 minutes of every single hour of every single day in every single year, year in and year out. These facts almost certainly understate the true numbers of hate crimes committed because victims may be fearful of authorities and thus may not report these crimes, or local authorities do not accurately report these violent incidents as hate crimes and thus fail to report them to the federal government. All Americans have a stake in reducing hate crimes. These crimes are intended to intimidate not only the individual victim, but all members of the victim's community, but even members of other communities historically victimized by hate. By making these victims and communities fearful, angry, and suspicious of other groups, and of the authorities who are charged with protecting them, these incidents fragment and isolate our communities, tearing apart the interwoven fabric of American society. Eliminating prejudice requires that Americans develop respect for cultural differences and establish dialogue across racial, ethnic, cultural, and religious boundaries. Education, awareness, and an acceptance of group differences are the cornerstones of a long-term solution to prejudice, discrimination, and bigotry. Hate crime laws and effective responses to hate violence by public officials and law enforcement authorities can play an essential role in deterring and preventing these crimes, creating a healthier and stronger society for all Americans. But most important of all, eliminating prejudices and teaching respect for all racial, ethnic, cultural, and religious individuals and groups begins with ourselves, individually and collectively. In this exclusive network TV special, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines to uncover the tragic story of a triple murder in the heartlands of America and the civil lawsuits that followed after the conviction of the two murderers in Violence Against Women, Tina Brandon's story. Hilary Swank won the Best Actress Academy Award for her powerful portrayal of Brandon Tina in the 1999 movie, Boys Don't Cry. In this network TV special, you will meet the two dedicated trial lawyers, Herb and Dan Friedman, partners of the Friedman Law Offices, who filed the civil action for wrongful death, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and other claims filed on behalf of the estate of Tina Brandon against Richardson County and its former boss hog character, Sheriff Charles Locks, in one of America's and Nebraska's most notorious triple homicides. Brandon Tina lived and loved as a man, and for that, she paid with her life. Brandon was born female, but felt male inside. Although Brandon found happiness with a girlfriend and made a number of friends, he was brutally attacked and later murdered when his secret was discovered. But to a few people in Nebraska, it is simply the sad tale of the child, sibling, and friend they loved and lost. In the years since her death, Brandon Tina found the support and acceptance she never knew in life. Boys Don't Cry sparked a broader conversation about gender identity, sexuality, and violence against women. Transgender violence targets both men and women, but Brandon Tina's case highlights its particularly brutal effects for FTM transgendered individuals. Boys Don't Cry and this new Insider Exclusive Network TV documentary provide a clear political incentive to integrate feminist, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender concerns in the analysis of violence against women. It also graphically illustrates the stakes for feminists to forge strategic political alliances with these communities in order to challenge the mutually reinforcing discourses that relentlessly pursue the truths of identity and enforce these truths at both the micro level of the female body and the macro level of national policy. In getting justice for the estate of Tina Brandon, Herb and Dan Friedman have earned the highest respect 
from citizens and lawyers alike as some of the best trial lawyers in Lincoln, in Nebraska, and in the nation. They have seen many innocent and hardworking people become victims of hate crimes. They understand that hate crimes are one of the most serious, enduring, and divisive human rights violations in the United States today. The problem is not just in Lincoln, Nebraska, but nationwide, and its nature is institutionalized. And because of that, they are driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. Their goals, not only to get justice for their clients, but to make sure that all victims of hate crimes get justice. Because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And justice and power must be brought together so that whatever is just may be powerful and whatever is powerful may be just. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Lincoln, Nebraska. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Herb and Dan Friedman to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. Hello. Tell our audience a little bit about um, your firm, what kind of cases you handle. Our firm is primarily a personal injury law firm. We represent people who have been injured as a result of somebody else's conduct, injured or killed. Uh, and we have also, in recent years, also done a lot of work involving uh, child sexual abuse and also civil rights litigation. Um, regarding today why we are here. There was a movie, Boys Don't Cry. Hilary Swank starred in it. I was reading a little background of her. She worked for $75 a day. Can you believe that? She was paid no more than $3,000 for the whole movie. She won the Best Actress Academy Award. Uh, the movie came out in 1999. And we are doing a follow-up story on that case, uh, not the criminal case, but the civil case of Tina Brandon. Who was Tina Brandon? Tina Brandon was a young lady from Lincoln, Nebraska, who was about 21 years old. Uh, she'd come from a, a, a very disruptive family. Her uh, father was killed uh, uh, when she, before she was even born, I think. And her mother was about 16 years old at that time and had already had another child. And they, she lived a kind of a rough, uh, difficult existence uh, with her mother and her sister. When Tina had been a very little girl, eight or nine years old, there's evidence that she was sexually abused by an uncle. And uh, that had a, a significant impact on her life. Ultimately, uh, Tina developed what's called a transsexual ideation. Now, we don't know whether the rape had anything to do with it or not, but suffice it to say that Tina did not want to be a woman. She wanted to be a male. And she began dressing as a male dating women mm -hmm. uh, and uh, live the life of, of a female for a period of time. Right. And this was in the late 80s, early 90s, correct? Um, what happened? Well, Tina hooked up with uh, uh, some young people down in uh, Fall City, Nebraska. Tina actually came from Lincoln. Fall City is a community about 80 miles southeast of Lincoln. Posing as a, a male. She posed as a male. Yeah. And she changed her name from Tina Brandon to Brandon Tina. Mm -hmm. But still had a driver's license of Tina Brandon. Mm -hmm. uh, while she was down there, and she was only down there for a month, she began running around with uh, a crowd of kids, including in that crowd, included in that crowd was a man by the name of Lauder and a man by the name of Nissen, two young guys, yeah. both of whom were ex-convicts, both violent people. Someplace along the line, they discovered that Brandon Tina was, in fact, Tina Brandon. And on Christmas Eve, Tina was taken out and raped by these two men. Beat up, too. She was beat up, and she was taken back to the home of Mr. Nissen, placed in, a, in the bathroom, yeah. locked in there, and she broke out and ran barefoot through the stove, yeah. Uh, to a friend's house about six blocks away, battered and beat. Immediately they called the police. They did a rape kit on her 
and she was taken to the hospital. And subsequently, she ended up in the uh, hands of a man by the name of Charles Locks, who was the sheriff of Richardson County, Nebraska. Right, and she told the sheriff what happened. She told the sheriff what happened. Basically, he didn't believe her. He treated her disrespectfully. And he didn't do what he should have done, is gone out and arrested the men that had assaulted Tina, right? Well, actually, he knew these guys. He yeah. knew they were ex-cons, and he knew they were violent. Yeah. And he saw this girl had been beaten up. Sure, that's exactly what he should have, what he should have done. Mm -hmm. And because he didn't do that, it allowed them to learn of the fact that she had reported this rape and this assault. Well, he called them in. Yeah. And uh, they murdered her. On, Subsequent on New Year's Eve. Yeah. Subsequently, they were convicted. They murdered two other people, too. They murdered two other people, a total of three. They were convicted. Now, where you enter the case, because you had a civil suit on behalf of the estate of Tina Brandon, correct? We were brought Tell our in. audience a little bit about what that was all about and what happened. Well, we were brought in to handle the civil litigation. Yeah, because there is a civil case based on the fact of what? Well, there were two civil cases. Mm -hmm. There was a federal case that was filed under Section 1983 of the Civil Rights Act, which was basically a civil rights act against the sheriff. Yes. That was dismissed by the local district court and also affirmed by the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Then there was a case filed under the Nebraska Tort Claims Act, yeah. simply for simple negligence. And that case proceeded to the Nebraska Supreme Court. Uh, originally it was dismissed, it went back to the Nebraska Supreme Court. They reversed it and sent yeah. it back for trial. Uh, we tried the case, got an, uh, an award. Uh, the award was not very good. Yeah. And it went back to the Nebraska Supreme Court and they sent it back for yet an additional trial. And went back for a third time. Mm -hmm. So we, went, we followed that case for three appeals. Yeah, what, what amazed me was that this particular case, you were doing this on your own dime. That's Nobody correct. was paying you to do this. No. But you felt justice should happen here, right? That's right. We felt that this was a significant case and that yeah. his family had really been mistreated. And the litigation took, what, how many years? Four or five. Four or five years. And uh, initially it wasn't receptive by any of the courts, but eventually you got some sort of justice, correct? I think the last appeal came up sometime in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about hate crimes in general, because you hear a lot about them. A lot of people don't know what a hate crime is. What is a hate crime? Well, a hate crime is basically when someone is injured or murdered, not only because they're an individual, but because that they belong to a certain class of people, mm -hmm. certain race, a certain sexual identification. Mm -hmm. Hatred of the person more than just the personal hatred. Mm -hmm. How often do hate crimes occur? More often than they should. Mm -hmm. And why do they occur? People are very prejudiced and they're mm -hmm. very uneducated. This originally was filed as a civil rights case, in essence, even though under the state law it was, I've, I forgot the name of the term, it is in essence a civil rights case, right? Well, it wasn't a civil rights case when it got to the state court. Yeah, but I mean, in federal it was, court it, it would was have a civil been a civil rights, rights case. It was a civil rights case. Because it was a violation of Tina Brandon's civil rights. What are someone's civil rights? What are civil rights? What are the civil rights that every American enjoys? Basically, they're contained in the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. And people are entitled to have those civil rights followed. Mm -hmm. And if someone uh, uh, rejects those, deprives someone of the civil rights, there is usually a claim under a, a, a federal law that was passed during uh, the Civil War period. Which is the statute 1983, yeah. is that correct? 43 U.S. Code, section 1984. If you, 42. 42 U.S. Code. If you feel that your civil rights have been violated, you know, we have nationwide audience watching the show, what should you do? Contact a lawyer. Contact a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer. Civil rights lawyer. Because there's a lot of lawyers that don't handle these kind of cases, right? That's correct. correct. And how do you evaluate whether you have a good case or not? Well, every case is different. It depends on the person that's making the allegation and how they're going to appear before a potential jury. Yeah. 
and what the injury was and what mm -hmm. the authorities in question actually did to the person. I mean, there are so many factors you yeah. have to evaluate. You have to talk to the witnesses. Did yeah. anybody see this happen? Is there documentary proof of what happened? Right. Well, in often, often there's in these type of cases, the, the accused is going to deny everything. And oftentimes the accused, like the police department, right, law enforcement, has a lot more credibility to a jury than someone who's been on the out and out, correct? Absolutely. How do you overcome that when you decide whether you want to take a case or not? Because you know it's going to be an uphill battle. Well, you, you got to have some corroborating evidence, mm -hmm. something that corroborates what the injured person is saying happened. Mm -hmm. And you got to have a person that you got a shot at persuading a jury to believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the very reasons that you identified. And generally, if you take on a case, a civil rights case, uh, what is the procedure? You file a complaint in federal court, correct? It depends on where it happens and, yeah. and, and what you're really alleging, but yeah, we typically would file it in federal court. How long do these cases take to resolve? In federal court, um, you can get a trial date typically within a year of filing the case, mm -hmm. but the appeal could, could last 18 months to two years after yeah. the trial happens and depending on the appeal it could last even longer if there's a new trial that's ordered. Do you find in cases like this, because I know you handle a lot of different cases, do you find that settlement offers come forth in civil rights cases or do you generally take them all the way to trial? Depends on the case, mm -hmm. but frequently civil rights cases are tried. Law enforcement officers usually don't like to admit that they've done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, even if you get a favorable verdict, it's appealed, and you have a lot, another long process, That's right? That's correct. These um, cases t take a long time, and they're very expensive to put on. What do you think the, the lesson to be learned from the civil rights case that you filed on behalf of Tina Brandon is to all Americans? They should stand up and be heard. People should not lay down and uh, do uh, what uh, the law enforcement thinks that they ought to do. Mm -hmm. They have rights and they should stand up for those rights. Do you know if there's any changes? I know the sheriff that was the sheriff at the time is no longer in office. He was voted out of office. Yeah. Do you know if the, the department implemented any new changes about the way they handled cases like this? No, actually I think in that particular situation every law enforcement officer in, that was involved in it testified on behalf of Tina Brandon. Mm -hmm. They all thought that what he did would fell way below the standard of care. Really? Good. And the Nebraska Supreme Court finally made a ruling that this was outrageous conduct. Yeah. Well, I uh, want to thank you both for being with us today on this show because again, this is another story, another case where the financial rewards are very much in question uh, when it comes to pursuing cases like this, but yet you fight on behalf of the underprivileged, the oppressed, and the people who really have no voice to try and get justice for them. And that's what our series is all about. And thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.